And there we go. We're live, sort of. Not really, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Neil, live enough. <laughs> live enough. Neil, it's been a minute, man, uh, since we talked. How uh, how you been doing, man? How are things in Toronto or Toronto? How are things uh, sunny over there? How are things? Things are great in Toronto. Uh, it was a beautiful day today. We went out for a little trip down to Woodbine Beach. So we laid out in the sun for a while. It was nice and cool, actually, down by the water, as opposed to uh, up where we, we where our condo is, where it was like really super hot by the time we got back. So it was great, great times. Uh, things are kick, you know, kicking in for summer already. The weather's getting great, so cannot complain. Yes, sir. The uh, the world's opening up now. There's a uh, light has come around. <laughs> the tunnel is over. <laughs> yeah, there, yeah. There's still some uh, some hills to climb in regards to that for some people in this country, but hey, let's not talk about it. <laughs> I remember, I remember, I know. <laughs> we touched piece, of the piece by piece last time, but uh, yeah. there's so much music to get into, man. There's obviously, there's so much to talk to you about, and I can't wait to do it. Um, we'll talk about the new band, obviously, the new stuff in a few minutes, but I want to touch on a couple of things. Uh, let me, before I hit you with, uh, like I said, we did so many, we talked so much last time. So much of your past is like toxic, so much of, the, uh, of your career. It's a big part of it, right? So, of course, you can... <laughs> couldn't help but talk about that a bit but there's so many other good things you've done like uh so let me just kind of uh, get back to where we ended off last time so when we last talked your new project or it wasn't new but you read you reformed and did some singles with the uh with your band child a child with a y and uh, you released a couple singles on that and then it was kind of i think the impression was at the time i think the basis left it was kind of almost over at that time what kind of happened with child uh, uh as towards the end of it well, yeah, uh, I, w I actually re-listened to that interview again before we started today, just to make sure. Nice. I, I don't go ever, you know, don't make any mistakes with what I said before. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, the thing happened with the bass player from Child. He was uh, not happy with the way I played drums on the track. And no matter what I did, I thought he didn't like the mix too or something. So I, I did, I redid a bunch of things with that. And no matter what, he was just not at all gonna cooperate. So I said, okay, like I, I said in the last interview, I just told him, I said, it's not gonna change. I know what I'm doing. This is the way it's supposed to sound. I mean, this is a song that was kicking around uh, for over 30 years. This was a, a demo that Child had done in rehearsals. This song called, it was originally called uh, Feel the Fire. Right, right, right. Th this is the last song that we did, and it had no no lyrics, it had no melodies, it wasn't finished musically, it had nothing. So we built it from the ground up, and it took a lot of work, like a lot of work, to make sure that this thing uh, was actually going to be completed this time. Right, right. So I went through the track arrangement wise and made sure everything was was actually finished. And then I started working on uh, the vocal melodies. And then I got together my wife and we collaborated on the lyrics to finish the song. So there was a lot of work being done to that song above and beyond just the bass part, right? right so yeah. he, he didn't change much from, from what he did over 30 years ago. Now I thought, okay, this is a perfect opportunity to start fresh. It's not a new song but it's a new approach. Right. 30 years so on. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, I've certainly in, increased my uh, vocabulary of drumming skills. I know that for a right. fact, yeah. as well as my songwriting skills and production skills and mixing and everything. I mean, I, I believe that I've come a long way since 30 years ago. Right. So w when it came time to finishing that song, I thought, perfect. This is great. This is going to be a wonderful opportunity to create something new out of something that was old and kicking around and was never finished. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had actually uh, offered the old guitar player once again to come on in, you know, I've got Todd Lefevre on guitars, but you can come on in you can, you can add some extra guitars or, or anything you feel comfortable doing. The original said, guitarist, right? Original guitar player. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, no, Okay, whatever, move on. Mm. And then the, uh, we put together the whole track, right? Like I said, we reworked it from the ground up with everything and finally had it finished. 
And of course, when I went back and, uh, and started reevaluating the track from my new perspective, I thought, okay, well, songs like this, if they're going to compete with it in the modern, the modern traditional metal world that's out there, there's this whole yeah. genre called traditional metal, which is yeah. based on the 80s. Yeah. I said, okay, well, why not you know, capitalize on a little bit of that genre, like try and fit in with them and make it sound a bit more like that. And of course, double bass drums are front and center with that style of music. It's always in there. So even though this track had been done 30 years ago and there's double bass in it, I put more in it, All right. more fills. But I, I totally, and, and, and this is the way I always do things, I don't just throw stuff out there and just like see if it's going to work. I construct my drum parts. I compose my drum parts. Mm -hmm. So every single note that you hear, like there's two schools of thought when it comes to drummers, usually. Well, there's many schools of thought. Some, some <laughs> the, two not base, so, the two main ones. Some, some not so good, but there's guys right. like Neil Peart, right? Yeah. Who totally writes his parts and sticks to it. He goes, this is what I created. This is what works. This is what I want the song to sound like. This is what people who now have heard the song they want the song to be like this every time they hear it. That's why people air drum when they used to anyways at Rush concerts, right? Yeah. Because yeah. they know all the parts. And then there's right. other guys, like the, a lot of the guys from the 60s who would be more jammy. You know, Improvise, I don't know what's... do different things live as a, they on the record. Just do with whatever they feel at that moment, yeah. Exactly. Real. So you hear yeah. the, the, the original version, yeah. and then you hear the live version. Sometimes you're going, is this the same, the same song? song? Yeah, what exactly. Happened, yeah. Know? Some people like that. Some people get off on that, too. Some people do, but yeah. to me, it's like, unless you're really, 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 really good, don't go down that road. Yeah. Just give the people what they heard originally yeah. on the song. Get on the record. Play Freebird. Exactly. <laughs> so that's what I like to do. So that's what I did with the, in the Field of Fire. All right. And um, I was completely satisfied, happy with it. And everybody liked it. That was involved with with uh, the, the production of it. Everybody liked it except the bass player. So I said, "Okay, this is not going to work, and it's not fun." So yeah. as soon as it's not fun, see, it was it was kind of fun up to that point, right? There was a there was a lot of drama involved with, uh, like I said, the old guitar player. Who was he going to do stuff? Was he not going to do stuff? We didn't know. So eventually, we just uh, moved on from him. Mm. But it's got to be fun. And it was fun. It was fun up to that point. It was fun, even though there's some other drama involved in, in the releasing of the ride out video, things like that. I didn't care. I'm still having fun. I paid for everything. I paid for everything to do with the the uh, re-releasing and the re doing the recreation of those old songs and mm. bringing, them, bringing them back to life. On the ground up, yeah. But I didn't care. I did it. I did it out of love for the music and respect of the music. And it, ha it, was, it had to be fun. It, and the second, the very second it stopped being fun, that's it, finished. So I just don't bother talking to that guy anymore. And me and Todd, the guitar player who I brought in to do the, the child tracks, mm. I'd known him back in the early 2000s. And of course, he was in a, he ended up back then, he got into, well, he was in a band uh, called Alpha Galatis. And Alpha Galatis was one of the last rock bands that was actually signed to EMI Records. So he's, really? he's no slouch on the guitar. He's, he's really, really good. And I had mm. him involved in the child stuff. And, you know, he was, he was having fun with that. But it wasn't his music. And this guy's a really great musician. And he's a great composer. So I knew it's like, okay, well, it's no more fun with this old stuff. Let's try something new. Exactly. I'm not uh, saying this just because you're here in front of me, but the production on that, those songs is just fantastic. It's so in your face. It's so big. It, it's massive. It's really well produced. I mean, not counting the songs themselves, but the actual sound of them sounds so full and so big. You did a good job on that in the studio. That sounds just amazing. Oh, great. That's nice to hear. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, it's very, very good. It's too bad that uh, that went down. Because I can, I can imagine if you really felt something strong about it you could have got a different bass player found a different guitarist uh, maybe even got a different singer obviously because nick wasn't going to be there the whole time as we know you if you you could have moved on and did other things with it if you really wanted to but the fact that you 
kind of put to rest means that you had a vision, one vision for child, right? And if that didn't work out, you weren't going to do it at all. Fun or not, just, you weren't going to continue. There was no chance you're going to continue that with other musicians, was there? No, no. There was actually uh, some more songs that were, that were on deck to be redone um, from, from the old child back catalog of, mm. of rehearsal demos that we did. Mm. And we had another one. I had another one recorded with bass, and I just did some basic drums on it. And we had Todd come in and do another one. He did full guitars on this other song. And, but they're never going to see the light of day ever oh, because they're right. just not going to be finished. Right. I mean, they're good stuff. And then, but you know what, now that we started, uh, me and Todd heavily more doing the collaboration, it's kind of like, he, he's a lot happier now because now it's like, uh, he's not just a, a guy that I hired. Right. It's a brand new thing. Right. You guys got started together. Exactly. We're working right. together yep. and collaborating with our, with our, you know, our, collective uh abilities mm. and it's a lot different than when he was working with the child stuff with the child stuff like the, like i said that one last song that he did that he did on guitar and uh we were talking about it later and he goes yeah you know that song <laughs> that was not a good song just not cut he wasn't happy doing it he was doing it because he, was, he likes me right he right favorite of me yeah. you know i was giving him some some cash to do the tracks this and that but now that we're collaborating on on stuff from like ground zero, you know, obviously mm -hmm. he's he's going to be way more into it as yeah. he is. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I uh, can't wait to jump into that when we do. But uh, like I said before, we we touched on so many things before in the in the long interview. People can go back and check that out on demand, like you did. Listen anytime, Neil. We talk so much about slick toxic, and we'll touch on a couple of things there. I won't won't spend all day on that. But sure, any, anything, anything. We'll. Um, We'll touch a little bit on Twirl, though, which we did a little bit before because it was something part of your history. But I really want to dig down deep into it. I did my uh, homework assignment uh, yesterday and I looked more into the band or to. Well, it's you and your wife, to be clear, uh, Chantel. I think she goes by Chantel. And uh, so I want to talk about how that started. You know, I looked on on the website, which people can do anytime. And I looked at over the different places that you have your music placed in movies, soundtracks, TV shows. It's immense. I can't list it all here, obviously, but. One that I wanted to ask you about is uh, Counting Cars. I think you uh, it's on there as, as music you submitted for that show. For those that don't know, that's uh, Danny Coker. That's Counting Cars out in Vegas. Uh, he's actually in a band himself, Count Coker, uh, Count 77. Uh, talk to me a bit about how you um, place music in there. Did you have any uh, direct contact with Danny or how did that come about? No. Um, what we do is we, we use various music licensing companies, right? Hmm. And there's, there's quite a few that we've, uh, we've used over the years. And some of them, it's it's just kind of like, almost like a, a dumping ground of songs. Like, we'll have a, a batch of songs, and we'll just upload it online to them. We'll do the paperwork online, and it goes out to the universe, right? And we we'll just right. kind of just wait and see what happens, right? Other ones are a little more boutique, but this one company that, that got us in there, literally, I have 400 tracks with them because each track has like four different versions right oh wow. so every every song will have like the full version with vocals the instrumental the bass and drums version the no lead guitar version and what other other sub mix i can come up with so this one company has like i said oh, like 400 different tracks of mine and they're the ones that that have gotten a lot of the reality tv shows because that's kind of their specialty and it's just simply a matter of like checking my SOCAN statement at mm. one point and saying, oh, okay. Hey, we we're on uh, counting cars. You know, we're on counting cars again. again. The replays, the reruns. Do you, right. do you actually, there, there's so much obviously places that your music has been, but have you actually just been watching a show or watching a movie and heard it? Like you, I, you know, it's there, but have you just been surprised? Like, oh, my music is there. Has that ever come up? Yeah, actually uh, quite a few times we've been just sitting watching something. We had no idea. Wow. And we're like, you recognize that <laughs> that's us no it's not yeah yeah and so, is it us did they copy us i hope it's yeah. you for real <laughs> it's not somebody trying to uh to cover it you know what i mean yeah to cut well, you out fortunately no it's been us every time um, it's amazing yeah some some really funny things some really odd sort of uh 
things that you wouldn't expect. You know, mm. we're, we're watching, um, we got a subscription to the CBS online streaming service because they had Melrose Place. All right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we were watching Melrose Place. And at the beginning of Melrose Place, of course, they have their theme thing that comes on. Oh. And then before the actual acting starts, they have this other part that comes on where they would have music. Mm. Right. So yeah. after the theme. And one time it was like, that's us. It was one of our songs, like one of our, our songs from a long time ago. Now you're thinking, okay, that show was from the 90s. But what yeah. happened was when they re release that show onto DVD, yeah. back in the day, some of the songs that they had in the show that was aired, they had to uh, get a big license for those. Those licenses run out for people that don't know yeah. the business side. Yeah. And they don't transfer on DVD too. It's a whole other yeah. business thing. That's why yeah. if you listen to TV shows we watched on the 80s and 90s and you listen to the DVD or on Netflix for that matter. And it's like, what? This song doesn't make, this isn't the same song. It's because they didn't get the license or they didn't want to pay for the big license, the cost. Exactly. It's all about business, business, my friend. Yeah. And, and, it, and the business helps us quite a bit yeah. because our stuff gets used sometimes to replace old stuff like that that's amazing so perfect that's cool so that, that that was one time that that kind of shocked us there's been a few others can't really think of anything yeah. i've always i've always been fascinated how that works like if you if someone contacts you directly like hey i need this i need this kind of piece for this movie this 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 uh tv show if you just create a bunch of music on your own and, and like you said upload it and then people you know if they they source it out they say this works in this this movie this works in this scene do you like i just wondered how not to go too far in the woods but how often are you just creating stuff for for a specific parts or are you just making music thinking this eventually is going to appear somewhere like how does it how does it go from your creation to where it ends up in a show kind of thing you, you kind of touched on it already but do you have anything where they've kind of contacted you directly and said hey we need you to write or do a piece for this no no that that doesn't happen with us um we just write write songs. We write songs that we like. Actually, when we first started doing this, uh, there was kind of a direction because we, we found that uh, the initial stuff that we were doing was getting used in a lot of female-oriented shows. Like the first stuff we ever got licensed for was um, fashion television, right. which is a yeah. notorious Canadian Toronto show. Mm. And... So because, you know, like she's a singer, female singer, she, she writes the stuff, right. a lot of stuff from the feminine perspective there. And it was getting used in a lot of girly type shows, right? Right. Our music was getting used. So we started saying, okay, maybe we should just kind of like specialize in songs that may get used like that. So we did a oh, ton, wow. a ton of songs like that with girl in the title. You know, right. yeah. it girl, girls night out, all kinds of things, uh, all, you know, centered around like things that women do and girls do. And, and uh, from that perspective, right, right. and they got used, they got used all the time. We got used in Pretty Little Liars. That was a big show. Right, I saw that. Yep. Yep. And they used, I think, I like five, of, five of our songs. Yeah. And we didn't know what they were ever going to use. Like, yeah, people don't contact us to like, OK, can you compose a song? We just write our stuff okay. and, and uh, what we've done more recently is, is not be so focused on saying, okay, let's do some stuff that's like, you know, focused more for, for girls having parties and whatever, stuff like that. For that genre. It's, yeah. And in, in, there's lots of party scenes and stuff that need um, songs like that. So we used to do a lot of like more specifying what we were going to write, but now we just write what we really just like to hear for ourselves and it still gets used yeah that's the main thing it must right. be hard to keep track of as well too obviously you have uh statements and stuff but it must be hard to get to keep track of as well you've done so much and this has been going on for a while now twirl yeah. if i want to i want to get into so you it's always been uh, you and your wife now did you meet her through doing this in twirl how did it all come together with twirl how did this project start uh actually we met after was it after you know, quite a while after slick talk it was around 1997 i met her i had a band that was looking for a singer <laughs> it was just <laughs> it was just like a, a top 40 kind of thing that i was doing right and then she was the only person that called and then later on um 
we started our own top 40 band. Right. And then, you know, one thing led to another and then eventually we end up married. Mm-hmm. So, but, but, uh, it was like during that whole time that, uh, I was out with April wine. Okay. That's where right? it comes in. Okay. So it was between, it was after slick toxic, but yeah. I guess during the time you were drumming, uh, replacing for those that don't know, you replaced the original drummer, Jerry Mercer in April yeah. wine for a bit. I think he was fired for smoking weed or something silly like that back in the day. <laughs> don't know if that's legit, but yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> Uh, you were there. You were there. So, yes, yeah, so around that time. Then. No, no. Okay. What actually happened to Jerry was he was undergoing some chemotherapy treatments. Okay. Yeah. Right. So he, yeah. he was out for a while. Well, you right. can understand him smoking dope, right? Maybe. Yeah. Medicinal at that time. Yeah. It was a very different time, obviously, than we're in here now in Canada. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So he, he was out for a while. I was in. Right. And it, and it was like literally just a few months after I got married, I was off again on another tour with April Wine. Mm. And it was during that time, I kind of was thinking to myself, well, you know, do I really want to be that guy that's like away for nine months, back for three months, hanging mm. out with my wife, away yeah. for six months. Yeah, working and, musician yeah, on the road. Yeah. There's, yeah, but there's different types of working musicians. And that type of working musician was not something that I felt was my future, right? right. There was plenty, plenty of opportunities. They, like after Jerry came back, they actually asked me to come back. I think it was three times. And every time I said, no, because that by that point, my wife and I had discussed like, uh, okay, well, why don't we form an original band or do some sort of original type act now that like, you know, you're done with the April wine thing. You don't want to do road work anymore. Mm. And it was perfect. It was like, bing, you know, light went off. Yeah. What, what do I do? I, I didn't play guitar. I didn't play bass. I didn't do anything other than play drums. I hadn't really written a song myself at that point. So she encouraged me to play guitar, encouraged me to do all this stuff. Wow. And uh, we went to a couple of studios to, <coughs> pardon me, to uh, record some demos. We went to a couple of different studios, spent a lot of money on uh, getting a result that was just unsatisfactory in every way. So again, bing, light went off, and I said, I better learn how to do this too. So there was a, a, a whole period of time where I was just putting my nose to the grindstone, trying to figure out how to do this, play guitar. Yeah. What year was this, Neil? So we're sorry, clear. This was this was uh, this all started around the late nineties and up to the early two thousands. It took me about maybe five years to uh, to fully get into being able to write songs by myself, being able to play guitar, bass, mm. being able to play some keyboards, being able to do some recording on my own. Wow. And it's just because I had to do it so much, right? Mm. Like when, once we started and we got just a little taste of some licensing, which we got like re- very quickly after we, we had gotten into it, even with the first demos that I did, and we just started firing off stuff uh, as much as we could with our connections which we didn't really have, but we did. We started sending out all these songs, well, the songs that we had at the time. Right. And right away, we were getting bites on things. So we figured, okay, we're going in the right place. Yeah. Phase so, two of your career, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so of your stuff, we, your music, yeah. Not playing with somebody else, yeah. I got you. Yeah, and it was great. And that's how I uh, developed all my, my new chops, right? <laughs> my new yeah. skills. Yeah. And it's just because once we started doing it, writing 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 and we didn't do anything else like sure we had day jobs she had her job at the time i was i was still teaching full time at the time right and but we were all our all our spare hours were spent working on our new phase here that we were doing mm-hmm. and just writing our own music and learning all the the skills especially me learning all the skills i had to do to produce this music and get it out there but if you just keep doing it every day, you got to get better. That's just how it works. So that's that's how it that's how it happened. Exactly, and it's still going to this day right. as well, too. You're still making music together. You're still putting songs out there. You're still putting placements out there. It's still going on. So, but for the better part of 20 years, then you've had this going on longer than yeah. pretty much your other bands. If you really yes. think about it, this has been your main thing. Yes, and yeah. way more successful. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Let's just say 
I made I made uh, probably zero dollars with Slick Toxic, <laughs> and the whole time, you know, when I think back, there was there was a lot of good shows that Slick, Slick Toxic played, like some you know some packed out places, and there must have been some money flowing around, but I can't remember making too much from it. But yeah. uh, the same thing. Well, April Wine, I, I got paid. You're paid. you're you're a salary musician there, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. but still, it's a good money, gig. The money that we made from uh, music licensing actually paid off our condo in Toronto. So nice. it's been worth it. Sometimes, you know, you got to buckle down and we didn't go on vacations. We didn't do anything to waste their money or our time. We mm -hmm. just spent the time and worked hard and it paid off. Well, it's true because you stayed in music as well, too, and doing and being creative because a lot of people like when your band when Slick Toxic ended, you could have just, like you said, got a day job, went into a different career or just, or kept teaching what you were doing, which is still music related. But you could have left the business. You could have left being an active recording, uh, producing musician, too. But you stuck with that, too, which is very cool. You stayed in the business, so to speak. Absolutely. Um, I've tried to work day jobs. <laughs> I've tried, Chad. I'm not a good day job person. <laughs> I'm not good at day. I'm not a good day person too. I'm just. <laughs> I woke up not long before <laughs> we started this. <laughs> in full disclosure, yeah. Yeah. What's weird is you know what I like getting up early now. I really do. I don't know. Things have changed. Change, uh, change. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting a little bit older, right? <laughs> so now I actually like getting up at like eight o'clock in the morning and sitting out in the sun. But uh, yeah. You're That's more productive that way too, I think. Yeah, believe it or not. I know nights, there's lots of, it's good. Nights are good, but you can really be productive, especially for writing and doing work. And everyone's awake at that time. So if you need someone, if you're working with someone in the studio, obviously daytime is going to be where it's at. Oh, for sure. 100%, yeah. yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, you've never played. Have you ever played live or done live shows with Twirl? Have you guys ever done concerts or shows anywhere? Is it all, is it a studio project only? We've never played a live show. Um, it's something we've we've often thought about doing, and actually, just prior to the the, the two year thingy that happened there, that put everything uh, put everything uh, on, on a stop. downward yeah yeah on yeah. on hold yeah uh, we were talking about it. We were thinking about doing it, but now that you know everything's kind of a bit back to normal, we're thinking about it again. You know, we've got a lot of good new songs coming up. Um, I always like to do new stuff. I don't like to, to dwell on old songs, you know, from the past. So it's like always new, 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 new stuff. So we've got a ton of new stuff coming. I, that's one thing about the last two years is I just kept on writing. Right. Yeah. I just kept on working on new instrumentals. And I, I just handed her a whole whack of them the other day for her to start working. And, uh, she started um, working on a couple of them. So. We got some good stuff happening there, some new stuff coming. But uh, for live shows, yeah, it, definitely we would love to do it. It's simply a matter that we're just so far out of the loop of the live playing scene, especially for original bands. Mm -hmm. we, we don't even have any idea where we would play or, or anything about it. So we're, we're kind of like we're like kids again with that it's like well what do we do yeah are Where you are talking go? are you talking just about lo uh, local toronto or just in the whole area like like the general ontario or just do you think it's hard to find gigs anywhere around well the country for that matter right now probably everywhere but uh, a band like us and our type of music you know uh we're a duo we'd probably just go out we'd probably get todd to play guitar for us mm -hmm. he'd be a, a great asset playing live yeah, but we just don't know where to play. I mean, I see lots of bands, lots of bands back out there playing, but it's like uh, it's like the return of the cover band proliferation again. They said everywhere you go, it's like cover band, cover band, or yeah, yeah. more important, or more specifically, it's uh, the return of tribute bands. Yeah, there's like thousands and thousands of tribute bands, and so we're all original, and we're mm -hmm. like a sort of a special. We're not exactly like. Uh, a classic rock band right you know so we don't know where we would play no the problem is promoters want to book something that they can bank on right that they know so if you're covering something well people know these songs are going to come out or if you're playing a certain type of music they want to, they, you're going to be able to come out to that before you're doing original music that 
really that no one's heard of as far as a live touring band because you're not twirl people are like well who what's who's that yeah there's neil busby from slick toxic but is he playing slick toxic tunes no probably no. not no that'd be fun though i gotta say to have uh chantelle singing some of those nick <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah. change a few lyrics that's that's just my unprofessional yeah. opinion but that'd be cool but either way you're not doing that so to them it'd be like well what are we booking here so that's that's unfortunate part exactly and yeah. it's understandable you know they definitely uh they need some sort of some sort of story yeah to sell it to sell it right? to people yeah exactly well they'd recognize your name but if you're not doing what they know you for which is you know select then why you know it's unfortunate it's sad but it's the reality it sucks it is. Yeah. It is. Hopefully you can do something out there at some point too. And um, and we'll get to it in a few minutes as well too. This is the um, band that you're working on now, which hopefully maybe this one will get some uh, legs on the ground as far as shows because people can kind of identify what this is. It's based on, if I'm right, I think I am. The name of the band comes from two of your, well, past bands, I think. That's Toxic Child. Uh, it's pretty easy for me to figure that out, but for maybe for those that don't, talk to me about how, of course, that came together, the name. And since when Child ended, this is the new project with Todd. Tell me how it uh, came together and who's in the band now. Yeah, well, like like I said, after the, the demise of Child, me and Todd decided to uh, just carry on and uh, collaborate and write some songs and just see what would happen. It actually took a year to put that song together because, again, all this stuff was getting in the way. So right. we had started the, the child thing fell apart February of whatever year it was. I can't remember. But uh, we started working on Back Alley Rat in March. And then it was just we just finished it like, you know, like quite a few months ago. And so it took a long time to put that song together. Only because uh, all this stuff was getting in the way. But now, mm -hmm. like I said, everything is a little bit more free out there. People are in a better space. So th the next song. I'm asking you about Toxic Child. and <laughs> Toxic Child. Yes. All right. Let's get into it. <laughs> How'd that start and who's in the band? And uh, Black Alley Rat is the new single. It's really, really cool. But I want to hear the nuts and bolts of how that all came together because it's, it's really cool. Okay. So, yeah, after the child thing had, uh, had its day and it was obvious that, that we could not continue. And like I said, it was no fun anymore. We decided, okay, let's have some fun. Let's do our own, you know, collaborate on some of our own compositions here, write some of our own stuff between me and Todd. Yep. So that's what we started doing. We got together. <clears throat> and like I said, it took like uh, almost a year to finish the song only because we weren't working together too much because of all this stuff going on. But um, eventually when we finished the song, we, we got together quite a more, like a lot more frequently in order to put the song together were you guys and, in separate studios were you at home and he was at his home and kind of trading back and forth like people do is that how you worked it at the start well, f fortunately todd it still lives in toronto and he's not too far away so he would come over okay. my place all right and it's you know what this this uh, long distance <laughs> it doesn't work <laughs> it doesn't work for anything you know yeah you gotta have human interaction and yeah. Quite frankly, it, the song would not have developed the way that it did if it wasn't the two of us sitting in the room. Right, that vibe, that connection. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah, just like instantaneously bouncing ideas off of each yeah, other. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's how it came together. So we, like I said, we started with greater frequency. We, we would get together and, and compose this. And in, in the midst of, of doing this process, uh, that's when I... I came up with the title back alley rat and we were talking about something a singer from a band and, and todd said uh yeah that guy kind of sounds like a, a a rat guy from a back alley rat or a, a guy who's in a i don't know he said back alley rat and i said boom that's the title of this song. when you heard him singing that's what he said that's how he described it as a back alley rat like a yeah, rat singing said, like a dirty that, rat <laughs> yeah nice so i said all right that's the name of the song nice and then uh we finished all the guitars, pieced it all together. That's the way I like to work. I like to, to get all the guitars composed, everything. And then um, I started working on the vocal melodies because I had the title. Once I have a title, that's it. I'm off to the races. Mm -hmm. So I, I demoed all my vocal melodies. I sent him. And usually that just uh, consists of me kind of like sort of pretending to say words, you know, so that I can just get like a, an idea of the rhythms. Right, right. The, the melodic content. 
like getting the melody line kind of thing going yeah, right? to yeah, see where yeah. it's going to go yeah that's fascinating to me how that works exactly. so we, we can get real in the woods on that too but for time's sake yeah. I'll, I'll keep it going but yeah that's cool yeah. how that works yeah so that's what i do and i sent it to todd and i, I had the, the pretty much the chorus was was done um almost lyrically too the, the weird thing was like in in my babbling right which is how i, I create the uh, the rhythms and the melodies right now my wife's a lyricist and and when i gave it to her she said well i actually thought you were saying some words so she actually just <laughs> she wrote, wrote down what she thought you said yeah and it all made sense <laughs> i would like to imagine what that what that look what that looked like <laughs> it all worked yeah that's awesome all this all this stuff that she thought i was saying oh, nice actually Maybe I was subconsciously, but so you had an idea in your head. Was she in the yeah. studio with you guys at the same time, just kind of sitting there with you, kind of working? Because she's a musician, she jams. Yeah, she's playing bass. Yeah. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the bass playing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll get there. Oops, so, slow down. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Yeah. So, yeah, I, we, we finished out the vocal melodies, and that's when I started working on the the rest of the track. So I I like to make sure that the 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 basic idea of the vocal melodies, that even a lot of the lyrics are done before I, I weigh in on the bass and the drums. I always, I always do drums last. Oh, wow. That's what I okay. do. People uh-huh. do it the other way around, but it's like, not the way I do it. Yeah, you do what works, you do, uh, what works for you, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, I played the bass. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, on the stereo track, what, nice. Yeah. I didn't know that about you. I never asked that before. Maybe the last time we talked, you weren't well. You weren't doing this, so I, I wouldn't have known. I never asked. I always assumed it was drums, drum, 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 drum. So that's why that's cool to hear that. Well, I taught myself everything. Yeah. Right? Now we have the story behind that. Yeah. Exactly. Because I had to. I had. Mm-hmm. I had to do right. everything because right. it got too expensive to to hire people, bring people to in, do, yeah, to, to do what I had to get them to do. Right. So after a while, it's like, okay, I got to learn guitar, got to learn bass, keyboards. Uh, programming so I did all that so for for back alley rat by the time it came around to doing the bass I I was gonna get a guy right I thought I thought I found a guy online and I said hey I got this song it's like an 80s rock song and zero response like like Uh. no enthusiasm whatsoever so I said all right take it as a sign Uh. Neil take it as a sign and then I said to Todd I said well you want to do the bass? He goes, no, you do the bass. Because he knows I play, I can play bass. Right, right, right. Yeah. I'm not a bass player, but I can I can record bass and make it, you know, edit it together and, and make it sound like I can play bass. So that's what I did. And so I, but the one thing I can do is I can use my my ears and think like a bass player. Right. So when I played the bass for that song, I was pretty happy with the results. But yeah. when it came to we finished it off, right? Finished the track. And I remember I told you I released it on Spotify, but I didn't tell anybody. Right. Yeah. Except for Chad Vice. Yes. And I couldn't get it. Yeah. That was the letdown. <laughs> I wouldn't play. It kept bringing me to a Justin Bieber song, the new one at the time, Ghost or some crap. And I was really? like, what the? Is this what you're releasing, Neil? Hey, oh, you, you no. do you. You do you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I gave, no, it I, the wrong, yeah. I gave it the wrong link. Oh, is that it? I just wouldn't play. Like even when you gave me, I think you gave me a second one too, and it just yeah. wouldn't. It wouldn't open. I don't know what's going on with that. So oh, I was like, oh, sure. yeah. But either way, we finally got to it. But yeah, that was. I appreciate that. Either way. Yeah. yeah. So we got it out there, and um, I don't know. We just started talking about doing videos because, like, my wife, she's a, a video, she could do video production really good. She she did the ride out video, right? And right. and tons of other videos. She's done all the twirl videos. Yeah. And we just started talking about doing a video. And uh, we go, okay, well, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you about the singer. Right? Yeah, I was going to say, I was about to interrupt you. I said, well, yeah. when did the guy, when did the back alley rat come in? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. So yeah. I have been doing a little bit of, uh, I do a little bit of mixing and, and production work for other people. And uh, a friend of mine from way back in the old days, guy, he calls himself Rob Rocket. Hmm. His, his name is Robin Carter. And he's a singer, and he used to play in a bunch of bands, uh, one called um, Slow Lick and one called Max Sinigan. And they were Toronto bands on the scene in the early 90s. Right. And his band, his band used to open up for Slick Toxic all the time. Oh, wow. Right? So I kind of knew him from back then. And then in the, in the process of Child, when Child was looking for a, a singer to do these, the songs that we've released, like I remember 
he contacted me on Facebook for just to do a friend request thing. Mm -hmm. And he, he became involved um, in the possibility of being the singer for the child stuff. Right. So right. he came over along with some other people that, that, that were in the running too. Now his voice wasn't right for that track, but I, I stuck it in the back of my head. I said, you know, the guy's a good rock singer. He, he knows his way around uh, definitely a certain style of, of, of metal. Right. Right. So yeah. I figured, okay, a classic maybe, sound. Yeah. Maybe down the road, he could be uh, involved in something. But in the meantime, um, I said, okay, you know, I'm, I'm happy you came out, checked out this, the child thing. So uh, I'll mix a song for you. And he had his, his band, um, Manic Mouth. And they're like a punk rock band. Mm -hmm. And he had all these tracks that he had recorded at another studio, but he wasn't happy with the mixing. So I said, you know what, just send me all the tracks, all separate tracks, and I'll do a mix for you. So I did a mix for him and he, he liked it. So I started doing more of his songs and, you know, we developed a, sort of a relationship to do with the, the music and yeah, working, working for him. Working chemistry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then uh, when it came to, um, actually Twirl did a video called uh, low battery <laughs> and we want, we wanted to make it look like it's kind of a band. Right. So yeah. we brought in uh, Rob rocket on bass guitar. So he's like the, he was playing bass guitar in the video just to make it look like a band. So he yeah. did that for us. So we were always doing things back and forth like that. And then when it came time to, to getting someone to sing this track, I said, well, you know, I think Rob, Rob Rocket will do a real, a real good job on this track. And he did. So we liked it. Yeah. Right. And we were, thought, you know, perfect. This is great. Great. Uh, it kind of captures the essence of what we were going for with this song. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and then we said, okay, let's do a video. And uh, that's what we did, but we needed a bass player for the video. So I just said, Hey, Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, a, you. like a utility player, like, Hey, you're not busy. You want to, you want to stand in on bass on this? And, that's and that's she, awesome. She was all over it. She thought, yeah, that's oh, yeah. great. And I said, well, you're going to have to learn how to play the bass part. Right. So she's not a bass player. She plays guitar really good. Okay. Um, she's a, you know, she's a musician. She yeah, plays yeah. Flute, plays flute, plays oh, saxophone. Wow. wow stuff Amazing. that she learned back in school yeah, the main yeah. thing of course is singing and, and lyricists mm -hmm. but uh i said all right you're gonna have to learn to play bass yeah. lucky for you i'm yeah. the bass player so i, I taught her <laughs> to play the bass part but she worked really hard it took her like a, a month to do uh to get it all done but then in, you can see in the video she was playing it oh i know if you didn't just say the story if you didn't just tell us this now there was no way i wouldn't assume that she wasn't playing bass she didn't sit in there and write it with you and play bass she looks natural she fits in with the band the style with the singer with you back there it's amazing like the whole it looks like a big cohesive uh, band unit it looks like you guys have been together for a while and the way you describe it is obviously different but man if you had to kept that silent i would have believed this is a band you guys formed got in the studio bam this is the band that's cool well then we achieved our goal yes you did <laughs> No, that's awesome. It looks so good. Back Alley Rat is the song that's out there. People can check it out. It's all over YouTube, the video. They can get the uh, single. It's going to play here on Paradise City and the new music section down the line, too, which I mean, we record those pre ahead of time. So it's always a delay on that. So it will come out there, but people can get it on demand or, or keep or if they hear it for the first time on Paradise, I'm, I'm happy they do that, too, because it fits right in. It's new music that sounds like it could have been released in 85, 86, 87. It's, it's just great. It makes me excited for what you got coming up. Can you talk a little bit about where uh, toxic child is going right now yeah we just started working on a new song uh, a couple of weeks ago i was just sometimes songs come up in weird ways i think i was brushing my teeth and and i started humming a riff right just just like a guitar riff just popped in my head so i just came in my studio here and i picked up the guitar and i just mapped out what the riff was on the guitar and then uh, Todd was actually coming over that night. And um, I said, hey, I got this riff. He goes, I got a riff too. <laughs> and, and they just happened to, to, to work perfectly together. Nice. Right? So uh, I said, okay, well, definitely the riff that I have. And I said, I actually have a title for it. And I have some vocal melodies for my guitar part, which I'm going to I'm definitely going to say it was the, the chorus of the song. And he goes, yeah, well, I definitely see mine as being the verse part of the song. So, boom, right away. You know, that's the way it's got to happen. It's got to happen very, very quick and organically. Organic. Yep. 
and yeah, that's how it worked you know it just sort of came out of nowhere like just floated in from yeah the, well i'm brushing my teeth yeah you never oh. know where it could strike you could wake you up in the middle of the night you could be yeah. doing other stuff you could be out on the beach today like you said and you could have got an idea laying out in the sun you could have you better have a guitar with you 24 7 man now that you're doing that because uh better carry that with you you never know when the inspiration is going to strike or a notepad at least to write down some lyrics something it's it's going to come strong well a lot of ideas that that i come up with I do a lot of writing just in my head right. and I figure if I can remember something, even just a, like a riff or a melody, sometimes that happens and, and I'll just like, I won't even touch the guitar or anything else and I'll kind of just keep it up here. And then <clears throat> in the course of my daily events, I'll, I'll work on it, yeah. but in my head. And by the time I get home and, and, and do something like, like pick up the guitar or, or whatever it is, keyboards maybe i'll have mapped out pretty much a whole thing and that, that's happened that's happened a few times and it's kind of interesting when it does you know yeah because it's like uh it's a cool experience to be able to kind of just like work on something with no instrument just in your brain you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> kind and of no weird. pressure to get something done no timeline no, no. one saying you got to complete this by a certain time we need x number of songs x there's no in this, there's no thing behind you a machine pushing you to like you got to get creative now or else we're gonna push you off like it, it's a, that freedom must be completely rewarding and, and while that freedom to for creativity must give you the makes you more creative i would imagine yeah i mean it's, well like sometimes it's good to get a push from something that's why i like to produce the stuff the music mm -hmm. that 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 i do in the, the back like the toxic child stuff you know when i record people i, I like to be hands-on with it and and definitely push people uh as far as like like pressure from a record company yeah it, it'd be be kind of nice to have <laughs> yeah there's there's good and bad or there's points on that too for sure you don't have that pressure but then you don't have that pressure you could take your sweet time and maybe sometimes yeah. you need direction yeah it can go both ways on that yeah yeah well it's just nice to have their money yeah <laughs> that's all yeah i appreciate your honesty but it's true yeah it's nice to have their advance right and a lot of record companies are doing that you think of uh I don't know if you've heard of them. You might have Frontiers Records out of uh, Italy. They're pushing a lot of 80s bands to get back together and and create new records. They'll give you, what, a $15,000 advance, $20,000 advance, whatever it is to go in the studio. You may not even write the songs. You're just the name. It's a super group of well-known guys, and they'll get in there, and they'll make a record. They'll never tour it. They'll never promote it. They'll do some quarantine videos. You know what those are about, where you're there, I'm here, and blah, blah. And that'll be the end of it, and they'll move on to something else. They'll take their advance, put a little creativity in it, and that's it yeah it's, it's still out there some sometimes too yeah yeah exactly and there's a market that's what uh the, the the disappointing thing about the slick toxic the way it's gone is like there's a market for everything these days oh yeah there's a market for everything because it, it's so open now anybody can release music and yeah. to hear that there's bands you know getting advance money from italian record labels it makes oh me it's think, true yeah yeah for for yeah, for classic What's bands. Yeah, for classic bands or just like a bunch of guys who have been in classic bands, just get the four of them in a in a room or, or whatever and just get them on a record. That's there's there's money in that, right? For 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 value for the names. But exactly. It's up to to jump on the thing. Um, we'll talk I'll hit you with a couple of slick toxic things on the end there just to uh just to sure. kind of end it off. But one more thing on the toxic child. Is there a plan for a whole record and some shows? I know we talked about shows being eh. But what is what is the future? What is the goal for you as far as Toxic Child? Do you have are you looking that far ahead? It's tough to look that far ahead. I mean, we've got a ton of twirl stuff to get done, too. I'm just happy to get one song out here and there. Uh, I also, of course, uh, you know, offer up these songs to all the music license companies mm -hmm. that um, that I work with. And they they snapped up that song like that. You know, they all yeah. like really dug it and I said yeah this is a great song we want it so I, I'm getting it out there for that too hopefully it's going to make me some money you know mm -hmm. and then really that's the goal I mean yeah that'd be, it'd be great Chad it'd be great to get out there and and do something live no matter what it is like like as, as long as it's something that I created the music for right I would I would get out there it's your passion your project your your expression right it's something that you can get behind because it's your baby your creation which was yeah. child but now it's also toxic child yeah i i always had plans for all this stuff mm -hmm. uh child too you know like um 
before the, the the whole thing actually before all this stuff happened two years ago we were we were going to be a relaunch do, yeah we were going to do a live show for this there were, there's these guys in toronto that did a book about the toronto heavy metal scene and it was a really good book and they were going to do a live uh, uh like a book launch thing they're going to have some big bands come in and then we were going to be on the bill i think we're going to be on the bill whatever and i was so looking forward to that you know but then it got killed by all this stuff and then there was mm -hmm. no talk about that show anymore and then of course the thing it, it came to its uh conclusion anyways but yeah you know like i told people before i, I would have done slick toxic live i do twirl live i do toxic child live i do it all Mm -hmm. if it was possible but i don't know if it is i know for one thing nobody wants to do this slick toxic thing so yeah it's a shame and I, like i like i keep mentioning if people want to know the your thoughts on that and, and the history of slick toxic really deep they can go back and listen to the audio that we did uh yeah i think last year it's been a while it's been a few yeah. it's been a little bit but it was it was really i appreciate like i want to say i appreciate your um <laughs> your candor and your in-depth how much we went on it's like toxic it's a big part of your career obviously not the only part but it's one of the first parts right no. that got you a start as far as your name as far as on a, on a on a national scale right it's like toxic so it's a big part of your history and you're very proud of that music obviously yeah. i want to ask you a couple of things about slick uh, about specifically about some clubs did you ever play um this may be a silly question because it's right there, but did you ever play Gasworks with Slick Toxic, the club? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, some of the first shows that, like, when I joined the band, uh, I think I joined in 89, and the, some of the first shows that we did were, were uh, at the Gasworks. We definitely Legendary played club there. for those who know in Toronto area, yeah, for sure, around the Scarborough area, all that whole area, yeah. Yeah, is played, it still is it still there? Gasworks? I don't know. I haven't been to Toronto in a long time. I've never been there. So is it oh, still the going? Ga the Gasworks shut in the early 90s. Oh wow. Okay. I'm way off then. Okay. I didn't yeah. know that. That's too bad. Yeah. And actually there was uh there was a big show that was there when they when they uh they said they were gonna close the place, right? They said that and Slick Toxic played that day. There was like a ton of bands there. Sebastian Bach was there. Yeah. The guys from Triumph. I've there. heard him talk about it. Yeah, yeah. That's where I brought it up. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I remember we were doing that show and they were selling t-shirts. And I said, wait a second. Did anybody read this t-shirt? It says soon to rise again. So they closed it. And within a month, they had remodeled the place and opened it up again. So it's so stupid. We oh, closed well, the place. You closed the place and then opened. But now, obviously, it shut down again, as you mentioned, too. So it went yeah. back down. Yeah. 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 It didn't uh, last long. I mean, the whole scene in Toronto died at, at around that same time. So, yeah. As far as the hard rock scene in the 90s. Yeah. The hard yeah. in the Toronto. Yeah. Which was amazing mecca for hard rock back in the 80s, as, as you well know as i'm finding out these days as well too and speaking of that too i want to ask you about another club this is in brampton but i was listening to an interview that uh todd kearns from uh, age of electric was doing recently actually talking about canadian rock music and the scene in their early 90s um i had a little twitter back and forth with him about this because he was throwing out names of different canadian bands that um, he heard about like in the early 90s and no one called in and no one talked about slick toxic so i tweeted about that i said hey too bad no one mentioned Slick Toxic. What a great band. He responded to that with, I've uh, played with them actually at uh, Hot Rocks in Brampton. He mentioned that. Is Do you remember uh, playing with Age of Electric or Todd Kearns at Hot Rocks in Brampton with Slick Toxic? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, because I, I was like, oh, wow, I got to ask Neil about it. It just, it just happened this week and I thought, well, I'm talking to Neil. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him that. That sounds cool. We played there a lot. We played at Hot Rocks a lot. And, you know, like maybe he was in the crowd, but he said he played with you guys too. You, you know who I'm talking about, uh, Todd Kern. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, his band got to be fairly well known at a like, certain point. But I think that yeah. was kind of after. That was after. Yeah. Slick was kind of going yeah. the other way and age was coming up at that time. He's a bit younger too uh, no, at the time. Quite possibly that could have happened. I'm not going to say that it didn't because I wasn't always there to watch the opening bands. So maybe at the time they were just like coming up, you know, yeah, I coming was, up on the scene. Is that a uh, cool bill, Age of Electric? Well, we wouldn't have known them so much back then, but what we know of Age of Electric now and Slick, that would be a, that would have been a cool little bill. I thought I got I to gotta find out about that. That's cool if that happened. I'm sure yeah. it did, but yeah, it's, that's cool that he mentioned that. And he obviously gave a shout out to Slick Toxic and said, yeah, I you know, love that band. So it was that, cool. It, it, probably would have been in like 
93 or 92, 93. Yeah, and uh, right, I guess yeah. that would have been like early on in, in that band's. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, before I think the stage. debut or just around the debut. I don't, I'm not uh, uh, huge on that. I think their first one came out in 95. I want to say it's my yeah. teen years. You're know, hearing those things on the old, the old bear here in, in, in Ottawa, but uh, yeah, those are precious memories too. The last time we talked about uh, Slick Toxic as well, it was almost the eve or the release of the, di- well, the digital release of uh, Doing the Nasty. And since then, uh, Smooth and Deadly's come out digitally as well, too. How do you feel about uh, finally seeing those, at least on digital platforms, the re-release uh, of the Slick Toxic, the two early records there? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that they're out there. You know, it, it should have happened a long time ago, but obviously there was things going on with all these record companies and uh being absorbed by universal, universal. music yep, yep. universal yeah, they're it is. everywhere it is <laughs> taking over everything it. yeah they got their so, yeah strenuous it's, hold on it <laughs> yeah yeah it's like a bunch of dr evils or something just like <laughs> strangled the entire exactly, music business. Yeah. i'm holding this no one can hear slick toxic but us we're going to keep this in the vaults we're not going to release it you know on a physical copy because that's a stupid idea no one's going to buy cds uh, yeah, I could go off on a tangent on that. I've I wrote on the Slick Toxic page like CD copies. I don't out of their control, but you know what I mean. I'm just like <laughs> you probably saw that too. That would be a big FD, <laughs> a BFD. Well, you see, yeah. that costs money, right? Yeah, exactly. Whereas digital is they like... can't. Yeah, they can't assume they're going to recoup the money because if enough people don't buy the CDs, it's not 1992 or 91 again. So they're not going to. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate. I'll keep my yeah. CD copy that I have, but uh, at least it's out there digitally. You know, it still has a chance because people nowadays, younger people and such who are into that kind of music, they're going to find it more likely on well, YouTube and, and digitally. So I kind of understand that no matter what, as long as people find it, hear it, they'll get into it. They can't go see a show, but they can get back into the van like I did years prior or years after. So hopefully it can encourage more people to check it out. Exactly. It, it's uh it's great music. It, it should be heard. Like I said, it should have been out there a long time ago. And, and unfortunately, it, it's all kind of part of a, an era of Canadian music, especially in Canada, that's been completely like swept under the rug. Yeah. It's like that whole scene of, of, of that, of all those bands that we were happen. a part of. Harem, Scaram, Sven Gali, all these Santers, all these, what's a little bit older, but you know what I mean? The whole yeah, era. Yeah. It's, 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 which is, it's April Wine, Brian Adams, Headstones, you know, the nineties, the, those, those ones, but yeah. forget about the ladies into that, into that period where you had those bands, yeah. Tea Party, Moist, all the, you know. Yeah. It's a, past. it's a very it's bizarre. Fun. Yeah. It's a very bizarre thing when I, yeah. I see like so-called classic rock stations <laughs> playing stuff from the nineties and, and, but you never hear any of those bands even though like like slick toxic juno award it's up there yeah oh there it is that's beautiful i'm glad you have it did you you all you guys got one right everyone got one in the band yeah or did you, or did you swipe that from nick no uh, <laughs> no they all gave it to you yeah got my own <laughs> i know you can't see my gold album it's up there right i can't see that but i see the juno that's very cool right so a juno yeah. award winning gold can album con selling. here in canada like yeah yeah and yet we can't even get on on the radio stations like i know it's, it's disgusting, really, but like it's like they, they almost like on purpose said, Oh, those guys, uh, okay, we don't want to like it's a fad, it's a, it was a, it was a, a blip in time, it's not what uh, people don't remember that, or that wasn't that big, it was a moment in time. That's not true. Look at those bands, like, I mean, I'm pretty sure some of the ones I mentioned, well, Sven Gali still has they have new music, they're um, still touring, people still go to that, Harem Scarum, still active, been active all these years. Uh, we know what's going on with Slick, but you know what I mean? If Slick was out there, I'm sure they'd be doing business too. I mean, it's not going to break the banks. It's not going to headline stadiums, but it's going to, there's an, there's an audience out there. There were people coming to the shows. People would buy a ticket. I'd buy a ticket. I'd be there in a heartbeat. And so are a lot of people. So it's unfortunate that that gets ignored on the radio, but that's where the internet comes in. And that's where the good part of it is. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So at least it's out there digitally. I'm happy. Yeah. Uh, that people can find it if they want to find it and uh, if they're looking for it it's there's actually some place to go now mm-hmm. other than like uh, people that are, used to post it up on youtube yeah or charge amazing uh, amounts on ebay as well too for the, for yeah. the records too it's crazy do you know if there's any plans for the uh irrelevant record the last one from 94 is that getting digital as well do you know anything about that 
Well, that was out first. That was out in 2015. It's on. Spotify. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. It's been, well, I have the CD, so I really looked at it on there, but I didn't know that. I think, I think now it's coming. Yeah, I think we did talk about that actually. So it was out there, which that's kind of funny that that came out first. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that because that's the, uh, the math, the original masters were, were in our possession or in Nick Walsh's possession. Right. Um, so it was much easier to get that out through digital distribution because there was no massive universal music. Yeah, that's true. It was out on this uh, strawberry records thing or this EMI subsidy back in the time. Mine says strawberry records. I mentioned that to you before. I thought that was hilarious, but uh, it's a, it's a great record. People need to check that out too. All the catalog It's different, but it's good, man. There's some great, great music out there from Slick Toxic and more from you, obviously coming out. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good album. Yeah. Last thing I'll ask you, Neil, I'll let you go. I appreciate your time. One last thing on Slick Toxic. I think I know the answer to this, but have you, since the time we talked, have you had any contact with Nick or anybody else in the band? Are you guys on speaking terms at all? What's the status of the rest of the boys in the band that you know of? I haven't spoken to any of them anymore. And I, I've read all, the, I've seen all the, uh, the interviews with the singer there. And uh, man, like, I don't know what he's talking about. It's almost like he hated being there or something. I've never seen somebody so like it's almost like bitterness or something towards something you were a part of that was a great thing, right? Which is yeah. very strange, very strange. The, the the tone of the interviews that he does when it when it comes to talking about slick toxic, it's like well, man, I don't remember it being that horrible of an experience you know <laughs> do you think it's because he just doesn't want to like when interviews bring it up like i did with you do you think he doesn't want to talk about it? he wants to move on to famous underground which i i can get that aspect of it too do you think he just wants to say okay well that's my old band i haven't done that in 15 20 years let's move on to this do you think that's kind of it in your opinion well perhaps but the last interview that that he did uh, just recently he said something like, yeah, and I, and I understand his position on this, like, unless you could get the actual original, the original band that did doing the nasty. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, definitely. And he said, uh, he wouldn't do a, a reunion without Pat Howard, Kevin Gill, Rob Bruce, myself, and him, right? right. He wouldn't do it. Okay, great. And he goes, yeah, because it was, it was the collective sound of all the different guys and the personalities and it created the, the vibe and the music. And yeah, I agree with all that. Right. But, but then he says he'll go out and do the Slick Toxic songs himself. As, but not as Slick Toxic or with Famous but, Under? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah okay. what, whatever he calls yeah. it, right? Whatever yeah. he calls it. So he said, on one hand, he won't get together with me and Kevin Gale. Well, I, I don't, I mean, I don't even, I, I guess... Who knows? Pat Howarth might be able to play. I don't know. I've heard he's like kicking around Scarborough in Toronto here somewhere. Mm -hmm. He could probably still play bass. The guy was an amazing or, bass player. Or, or Adam, would he, like, I know Adam came back. Adam Headland came back in after for, would he, maybe he could join in too or help out or he's part of the lineage, right? So yeah, he's part of it, but he became a professional bodybuilder. So oh, nice. I think he kind of, uh, he's in good shape to do a tour then or show. Well, <laughs> Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. He's he's out of the business, clearly. Yeah. But, yeah. but but my point is, you guys are all still here, still alive, still playing at some level. Well, for the most part, we don't know about some, but you, Nick, um, you know, you guys are still making music, still have your chops. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I was told that Kevin, or not Kevin Gale, Kevin Gale, he's still out there doing stuff with his own band, right. uh, so he can still play. Mm -hmm. But Rob Bruce apparently is is not in the greatest shape. But I don't know. I haven't talked to him personally myself. I don't know. I think Perhaps it's uh, it's another story if I actually talked to them. I like, actually spoke with Rob myself, mm -hmm. the guitar one of the guitar players. I don't know. So it's all just uh, things that I hear. But um, Slick Toxic was uh, not not the, the the greatest time in my life, but it was a a, a great time in my life. Right? Wow, well, I like and, how you said and, that. Yeah, and it was uh, something that I'm really proud of. And something that uh, I often think of, and I and I and I reflect on what we achieved, and what we achieved for a Canadian band, is uh, quite frankly uh, remarkable, you know. And, and mm -hmm. to think that uh, some people think that it was a terrible time <laughs> in their musical life, and and, and to reflect poorly upon it, and then speak of it like it was some uh, not great 
time period that like that they in, did not enjoy it much is is a mystery yeah it's just a mystery to me you know there's yeah. always ups and downs and everything right and, and a band a band is certainly uh more than capable of, of having ups and downs and, and positives and negatives but you forget about the negatives mm -hmm. especially you know, as just, years pass as we move on 20 yeah. 30 years into the history of the band where we're at 30 some plus years now since the debut or more so perspective exactly. change uh, you know any negativity that came up you overcome it you overcome it and then you you keep on doing and you keep on achieving your goals and we achieved a lot of goals like mm -hmm. you know we, we did great things we played we played at massey hall opening for black sabbath Nice. You know, at the yeah. time, you know, like when it's I amazing. think back, when what I a tour back, that was too for Sabbath. Yeah, wow. Yeah, great yeah. stuff. You know? Yeah. When wow. I think back on it now, like at at the time, you know, you're caught up in the moment. It's just another show. You're just doing it, but you know, yeah. I think back on it now, and it's like, wow, that that's that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That was Ronnie James Dio singing. <sighs> yeah. Vinnie Apice on drums, yeah. and that was like a classic uh, Black Sabbath lineup. And there we were at, at uh, Massey Hall playing along with. And a classic, uh, you know, a massive, um, amazing, uh, you know, hall like where Rush is played, yeah. where Rush is famous for, like just so much uh, exactly. history there. That's that's amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah. We, we even we even played. Um, uh, we did our own headlining show at the concert hall, which is eight eighty eight Young Street. That's also known as the Masonic Temple. Right? right and it's this big concert hall and, and so many bands have played there over, over the years like everybody's played there even led zeppelin played there back in the day oh wow and it's just a iconic i don't even know if it's open anymore but um everybody played there everybody all kinds of usually bands on the way up before they were ready to before play, they like, broke yeah before they got before, bigger yeah they play a place like that and we headlined that place wow and by ourselves and did really good. You know, we almost sold the place out. And that's another incredible, like in Toronto, we did that just mind blowing that's, stuff. You know, yeah, there's know. tons more that we did tons. Yeah. No, I to know. Me, it's, it's, it's a, it's a great, such great accomplishments. And, and like I said, it's, it's not the best time period, not the greatest, but a great period. A great of period of time. Yeah, for sure. You know? I can't say why uh, that's not uh, a new story where some people distance themselves from their past. It's not unique. Uh, I can't speak to that for him. I don't, I don't know him. I've never spoke to him, so I can't say for sure, but hopefully maybe when the 40 anniversary or 45, while you guys are all still <laughs> kicking in, you can still get one show. If you can make one show happen in, in the, in the 40 anniversary, I'll get, I'll get down there. I, I'm not going to miss that. And hopefully others, others will too. But in the meantime, if it doesn't happen. You're working on something great. You got toxic child. I'm looking forward to new stuff. I'll chat with you again, obviously, when uh, more music comes out. And if you do the whole record, I'd love to hear about that and promote the, the shit out of that, my friend. Thanks very much, Chad. Awesome, Neil. Thanks again for your time. Okay, we'll talk again and be well, my friend, okay? It's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to the next time. Yes, sir. Thank you again. Take care, Neil. All right. All right, buddy. That was great. I appreciate it.